started, before we start, I'd like to play a video for you. So take a look at this. Here we go. This is not X-rated, so don't worry. The American healthcare system is badly broken. The present system doesn't work, and it's going to take us down. We need a whole new kind of medicine. We're in the grip of a very big industry, and it doesn't want to stop making money. If I spent five minutes with you and then put in one of these stents, probably get paid $1,500. For me to spend 45 minutes with a patient to try to figure out what their true problem is, probably get paid $15. It's a completely irrational system. We don't have a healthcare system in this country. We have a disease management system. We're spending almost twice as much in America as any other country on Earth. By our lifespan, it isn't even in the top 20. 30,000 Medicare recipients die each year from care they didn't need. That's the equivalent of a jumbo jet crashing every single week. The aviation industry killed as many people. We'd be up in arms. The administration pays you based on how many patients you see. All right, who's next? If you try and buck the system, someone says, what can you do to get your productivity up? I'm not interested in getting my productivity up. I'm interested in helping patients. We're seeing the military just being a microcosm of the problem society's having. Soldiers' use of prescription drugs has tripled in the past five years. This medications I was on. Only by accepting that the American healthcare system is badly broken will we be able to seek out the escape fires, the potential solutions. There are answers. One company has figured out how to lower healthcare costs by more than 40%. We provide incentives for people to engage in healthier behaviors. The Army Surgeon General directed that we establish the Pain Management Task Force to take a look at alternatives to narcotics. How skeptical. So skeptical. I've gotten a lot of inspiration, a different perspective. There's a different way of doing things that is possible. If I think about what healthcare could be like, it would have a lot more care in it. The healthcare system is unsustainable. We're really mortgaging the future. Not just the health of healthcare, but the health of the nation. If there's any questions that I do not cover at the end of the talk, right before dinner, I'll spend a few minutes in going over with you any questions that you may have. Okay, so hold your questions to the end. There's going to be a lot of information that I present to you tonight. I can't present everything to you, but I'm going to give you a lot. And through that information at the end of the talk, it's going to provide you with an opportunity to make a decision. 
And the decision is whether or not what you're hearing tonight is something that you believe would be a system that would work for you to change your health and your life. But to change your life and to change your health, you have to have a system and you have to have a methodology. Because if you don't have a system and you don't have a methodology, but the thing is, we all collect a lot of knowledge, don't we? And we have knowledge and knowledge and knowledge, and more, it's like reading a book. You know, you read a book, and you read these, so, and, but whatever, and you just accumulate, but, you, but what happens? If we don't act upon the knowledge, it's just we leave. We're going to leave tonight, and it'll be the same. Nothing will change. So you're going to have an opportunity tonight to make a decision. Does this system of what I'm being presented with make sense? Does it make sense for me in my life? Does it make sense in something that I can adapt and have a system through the system? You're going to have an opportunity to become a member of that system. Okay? Okay, let's go from there. Now, I see tonight in the audience that there are. Uh, should I just let everyone get their salad first off? You can do that. No. Keep going? Yeah. I am wrong. <laughs> So as I look out in the audience tonight, I see that there's a good portion of us that are middle age. Huh. I'm younger, younger than me, of course. No argument. You know, there's no one right. I'd say middle age, right? So I'll take it. If I'm in the middle, I'm going to wait again, a long time. Again, let me see a show of hands. How many of you that are so, oh, I'm sorry, that are so called middle age? would prefer not to live out the rest of your life being fat, sick, and depressed. Oh yeah, you're not middle-aged, you can't go. Do you want me to ask that question again? Do uh, you like fat? Okay, this man likes fat. Because, because we're told, right? Are we not told in the United States that that's how our life is going to be as we get older? We're going to get sick, we're going to get fat, and we're going to get depressed. And then what happens after that? No. Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Then we become reliable on what? Medicare, our children, other people, right? Now, let me ask you a question. Do you believe that that has to be that way? Let me see a show of hands. Who does not believe tonight that it has to be that way? Because I don't. And it does. But again, I'm going to go back. Unless you do something to challenge the cause to go deeper and to implement something to change your life, your lifestyle, your health, it's not going to change. You're going to be resolved to getting sick, fat, and depressed. I'm not going to be depressed. Okay. I'm sick and fat. <laughs> we're, we're just let your salad be served. Now, my father, is anyone here a life insurance salesman? 
in the life insurance business. My father was a life insurance salesman for Equitable Life Insurance. He was a workaholic. And his son, who was a health care provider for decades, my father never took or utilized my knowledge. And he never took care of himself. He smoked. Uh, he exercised a little bit. He thought that you know, going up and down the stairs, you know, garden, was exercise. We're going to talk about that later, right? And he just didn't take care of himself. And he worked and worked and worked. And at, in his latter years, he took up golf. Did anyone play golf here? No one plays golf. Okay, we got a golf over here. And he couldn't wait to the day that he could retire because... During the course of his life, as he took up golf, he made a commitment he played every other day, but he still didn't take care of his health. And finally, he moved with my mom to Florida, and he retires, and a young man at the age of really 75 years old, didn't take care of himself, and is diagnosed with lung cancer. And from the moment of his diagnosis, eight, eight weeks later, I no longer had a father. He was gone. So, does it, again, does it have to be that way? It does not have to be that way. It's too important. And I'm sure you have important people in your life right now. Also, I want to ask you this question. How many people here, let me see a show of hands again, feel that they're here on earth for a purpose? and a mission. How many people feel that they have fulfilled that mission up until now? And purpose? Only like one hand. Only one hand, right? So let me ask you this question. There's water right over there. <laughs> so, how can you fulfill your purpose and your mission and your purpose in helping other people if you don't take care of your health and feel well yourself? Can you? No. So you have to start by, again, everything that I've been saying so far. Now, let me tell you a little bit about who I am and why I can be up here yapping to you. First of all, I'm a healthcare practitioner. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a chiropractor by profession. I'm an integrative and holistic healthcare practitioner. I'm a certified instructor in many, many advanced alternative techniques. I'm a Chinese herbologist. I've developed unique healthcare systems that are taught all over the United States and internationally. I'm also an author. I've just recently, uh, well, it's not so recent, I authored a book called Climbing Mountains. That's in my bio. And I also specialize, which we'll talk more about as we go along, in what's called functional medicine. Has anyone here heard that word, functional medicine? We'll, we'll get into that more. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there, a, is there a question? Okay, so here's how the remainder of the talk is going to go. As we move along, we're going to talk about, as you saw in the video, the healthcare crisis in the healthcare industry. We're going to talk about um, insurance the insurance component, the insurance model that's going on today. We're going to talk about stress, lifestyle, and what's called the four foundational pillars of health. We're going to also, and then we're going to end with hormone, understanding hormone and hormone balance and how it affects your health. And we're going to also talk and finish with what we do and how we produce and achieve the results.
results that we do in our practice in our office and give you the opportunity, as I mentioned earlier, to become a member of that. So let's talk about the healthcare component. Do we have some we have some slides on that? Let me see a show of hands. We just saw that about 15, 20 minutes ago. How many people feel that the healthcare industry is uh, not that uh, How many people here feel that the healthcare industry needs some fixes? So let's talk about it. What's the problem with the healthcare industry today? Tell me. It's drug oriented. What else? It's ineffective. What else? Why is it ineffective? No, no uh, education on preventive medicine. There's no education on preventive medicine. Very good. What else? Come on, everyone. Albert. Misdiagnosing. I'm going to ask one of the nurses. Uh, I'm sorry. Somebody else. Big business. What big business? Big farm. Say it loud. Big farm. Big farm. Say it again. Pharmaceuticals. <laughs> Say it again. I said all the average doctor knows about various drugs. Doctors are paid off. Also, do you know that I'm a little ahead of myself in the talk, but it's okay. Do you know that nutrition is not taught in medical school? It is not taught in medical school. Also, where are most where are most monies made in a medical practice? On what? You just said one of them you just said. In testing. Where else? In medication. Apart from of course surgeries. Now, we are not I am not against medicine, but is medicine a preventative mode? No, it's for what? For crisis. It's for crisis. How many people are on medication here? How many people? How many people don't want to be on medication here? Me too. How old do you think I am? 35. <laughs> I shouldn't have asked that question. I'm going to be 62 years old. So I think I look pretty good for 62 years old. I can do 100 push-ups on my knuckles right now. Right? You want that? <laughs> I'm gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna get my talk. You're getting my talk. What else? What else is broken in the healthcare? It said, right? We were being lied to. We've been indoctrinated by the pharmaceutical industry since we're the children. You ever notice, let me give you, you ever notice if you watch TV when, do you know that in the United Kingdom, the UK, that you're not allowed in the marketing component, that you will not see a medication commercial and then at the end of it all the side effects that take two minutes longer than the 20 seconds of announcing the medication? Have you noticed that? 20 seconds to tell you what the medication is and two minutes to tell you what the side effects are. Severe allergic reaction, rash, hives, and itchy, difficulty breathing, tightness in the chest, swelling, as the nice, pleasant music is playing. Right? OK. 
Okay, so we can all admit together that the medical system is really a broken system. It's crisis intervention. It's not preventative. It's not preventative. Okay. What about the insurance industry? It's a big lie. The big lie, vultures, what else? Is it insurance for health care or is it for sick care? Yeah. What do we really need insurance for? Your car. Prevention of what? Operation. Well, not really. Because now they're fighting about it. It's really for crisis intervention. It's really for crisis. See, the thing is, does insurance pay for prevention? Does it? Does insurance pay for prevention? Does it pay for functional medicine testing? Does it pay for test? How many people have had a functional medicine? Your functional medicine, we're going to get to it in a minute. No one knows what it is. You know. Tell me what it is. So I asked her what functional medicine is. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes, OK? Let's just stay here. So insurance is a model that pays for sick care. It is not a model that is geared to pay for prevention. Do you know that, so you saw in the film, what number was the United States in health? It was number 50. Do you know how much money is spent on the so-called health care system in the United States on every man, woman, and child? Take a guess. More than any other country. $8,700 meant for man, for woman, and for child. That's a lot. That's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. The truth. Also, today, your doctor, right? is here, we already established that the doctor or your medical doctor is not making or generating his income on prevention, on holism, on holistic care. He makes his money. And how much time, you notice, do you know that the average medicine actually changed now? That the medical, when you go to see your medical doctor, he's on crunch time. He only allots seven minutes with you and you wait in his office for how long before you get to see you don't even get to see him. <clears throat> you get to see the physician's assistant. Nothing, I'm not against physician assistants, and certainly the nurses do a phenomenal job. But you wait an hour, two, two and a half hours to finally see the doctor who spends five minutes with you. So they're forced to spend as little time as possible and then listen to your symptoms and boom, recommend something for you that really is not preventative. Really not preventative. Let me ask you a question. How many people here have been to or know what an endocrinologist is? Why do you go? Diabetes, thyroid, weight management, but, and what does they usually do, apart from the testing, that they give you? Pills, meds, thyroid, levothyroxine, synthroid, and so forth, which is not, wouldn't it be better to do something about the problem or the imbalance before it leads up to having to go to the endocrinologist to really determine the underlying cause of the problem? How many people say yes to that? That's what's available to you. But again, you have, what did I say earlier? You have to have a system and you have to have a methodology for that. Can we go to the next? Let's talk a little bit about 
Lipitor. Hmm? Everyone heard, anyone not have heard of what Lipitor is? What's Lipitor for? And is Lipitor, true or false class, a what's called a statin drug? Everyone's heard of statin? Statin. Anyone on Lipitor here? Anyone on statin drugs to lower cholesterol? You're hungry now. Well, remember, I'm in practice for almost 40 years. So that when I was first in practice, you know, they said that, okay, those that have a 250 cholesterol level will have a heart attack or, or at risk for it. Then they said, oh no, we have to lower that and make it 225. And then people at 225 were still having heart attacks. And then they said, okay, well, we're going to lower and we'll make it 205. And then people at 205 were having heart attacks. And then they said, okay, well, we better make it 180, and people 180. So is really cholesterol the answer? Do you know how much money is made a year on Lipitor by the drug companies? Billions. Billions and billions of dollars. Actually, about a year or a year and a half ago, there was a whole thing that came out, I forget where it was, that said that they were allowing physicians to use more Lipitor in their practices. Cholesterol is not. Do you know what governs? We're going to get, you know, I'm a little, but it's okay. Do you know what glands of your body regulate cholesterol balance in your body? They sit on your kidney, called the adrenal glands. Has anyone here not heard of the adrenal glands? They're your stress glands. They're your fight or flight. And those here, how many people came here because of that they generally don't feel good? Who feels like a 10 every day when you get up in the morning? <laughs> how many people came here because you generally don't feel well? Come on, it's okay. So every one of you feels great every morning when you get up? I want to go back to bed. <laughs> I think you're lying to me. It's okay. How many people came here because you have belly fat? And that your, was your primary thing. Now let me ask you a question. Does having belly fat make you feel good emotionally and mentally? Oh, great. So, so it doesn't allow you to function and be in your optimum, does it? No. It doesn't. So the, no matter what you came here for, how many people have high blood pressure here? How many people have diabetes, type 2? How many people have gas? <laughs> I didn't hear that. I, didn't hear. I think I missed something on that one. No matter what you came here for. No matter what you came here for. Right? Again, I'm going to go back. You need a system, and you need a methodology, and you need a commitment of something to follow that will lead you back to turn your health around to avoid all the things that we're talking about. What's he doing in the dog? Now, how many people think, you know, this is also what I hear in my practice all the time. Oh, Dr. Davis, I exercise. I said, Neil, tell me what you do. What do you do? Oh, well, I do the, I do the laundry. You know, I go up and down the steps. Oh, and I exercise at work. You know, I'm up and down in the file cabinet like this. You know, that's not exercise. So we have to become proactive. That's abusive. Who's that dude? Dr. Lane lives way into his 90s. Juicy. Look how great he looks. I think he was actually doing it. He was a good ad for having for exercise. Oh my gosh. Uh, I put myself in that picture. <laughs> That's Jacqueline. <laughs> Phenomenal. That's Jacqueline. Absolutely. Proactive. We have 
about nine foot four up. It was amazing. But it wasn't popular. Right. Go ahead. Go. One more. The first, the first gyms were Jack Lowe. Before you go there, I just want to say something. Is there anyone... Does anyone have a mentor in their life that has taught them how? Do we need a mentor, or do we need somebody to guide us towards something? I have a mentor. This is my mentor. Yes. Hang on. Who's that? That's my grandmaster, Young Sung Cha. Master Cha is 67 years old. Doesn't have a gray hair in his head. And I started with Master Cha in 1982. I was already doing another martial arts. I'm a second degree black belt in Taekwondo. He's my mentor. He taught me about life. He taught me about how to deal with stress. He taught me about diet. Now, that's him breaking a brick. That was my actually first promotion test that I did in Taekwondo in 1982 for my yellow belt. That's my mentor. And we all need a mentor. And I want to be your mentor. I want to be your teacher. And you have to have a mentor. You have to have someone that leads you along a path to teach you how to live and how to diet and how to eat properly. And the proper, you know, there's a lot of people that, that's Master Cha, my mentor. Very few international grandmasters in the whole world. We all need a mentor. You go to the next slide. What's your why? You know what I mean by what's your why? That's my why, right there. That's my wife, Lisa, and my son, Austin, who you met. We all, do we all have a why? Do you understand what I mean? What's your why? Why do we need to take care of ourselves? Why do we need to turn our life around? Why do we need to implement things to be healthy and feel great every day? Who depends on you? depends on you? Do you understand what I mean? Huh? Who depends on you? We can die right now. That's Sedona, Arizona. Who depends on you? Talk a little bit about stress. Now let me tell you something, 80%, can you hear me back there? 80% of all degenerative diseases, 80% starts with stress, comes from stress. You know what I learned from Master Cho? He said that most of the time, from, right, stress can be physical, chemical, and emotional. And a lot of times, it's emo that's just emotional because things in our life have affected us so that it causes our emotions and our mind to not live in the moment. You've all heard about that. We were, think about things that happened to us in the past, or we project that into the future. And when it does that, it creates a tremendous amount of stress in our body and greatly affects our internal organs, primarily your liver and your gallbladder. The organs of the body that regulate your bile and allow your body to itself cleanse itself or detoxify itself. <laughs> Chemical stress, we all understand that. Alcohol, environmental, physical stress, accidents, falls, trauma, and so on and so forth. They affect us. That's why lifestyle is so important. Changing our lifestyle. 
go to the next slide. That which is needed to sustain life, provide energy, and promote growth and repair of tissues is the purpose of food. And also, food, what is the main thing that you would think that we have to initially do to turn our health and our, and our body around? What from? Clean the house. What's the house? Your body is the house. And how do you think we have to start by doing that? By cleansing it. By detoxifying it. Cleansing it. In our practice, which we'll discuss in our clinic, 